Quebec signature events. It's a few minutes away from here. And all this information that I'm giving you right now, you can find it online as well. So if you just go to our website and you look for the Easter Sunday tab, the Good Friday tab, the address, the time, the location, at Google Maps, all that stuff will be there for you. Uh, but one thing that we're doing that's really cool is although service starts at 10 a.m. at 9 a.m., we're going to be packing hygiene kits um, for welcome kits. Welcome kits. Wait a minute. Hygiene kits? Hygiene kits. I got confused last week. Hygiene kits uh, for uh, some refugees who have been coming into the country. And we're, we'll be joining alongside World Relief to make some hygiene kits, toothbrushes, uh, soap, essential needs, etc. So that when they do arrive, they have the basic needs to get started. And that's really part of a heartbeat of our church. We want to be a church that not only cares for one another, but really cares for those outside these walls. So that's one way we're going to do that. And then I think we have one more, right? One more way that we do that is on April 15th. All right, this is the one that you need to really write down because April 15th is a Saturday. It's not a Sunday. All right, so we're just not going to come back again the week after that. But on April 15th, we're going to be April 9 a.m., 9 a.m. I was like, April 9th? No, April 15th at 9 a.m. Uh, we'll be at a park in Woodridge doing actually a community local cleanup. And so the city of Woodridge is doing an organized cleanup that day, and we're just going to join them and say, hey, how, how can we serve you guys? How can we come and just be the hands and feet of Christ, uh, just making and seeking the flourishing of our community together? So that will be on April 15th at 9 a.m., and that will replace our Sunday service. We don't want to make you more busy. We just want to leverage your time to serve those that God is calling us to serve. So we'll be doing that together. All right. All of this uh, we're able to do because you partner with us in so many different ways. And I just want you to know I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for each of you and the way that you give and your time and your talents and your treasures. And may we continue to do that for Christ and for his kingdom. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you uh, for the people who are in this room. And I thank you for those who will be joining us online later. I just pray for softness of heart to hear from you, God. Uh, would you use uh, Carl? Would you use his life, um, his story, his testimony? to speak and point towards you this Palm Sunday. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, welcome. It is Palm Sunday. It's not just Sunday. It is Palm Sunday. Now, if you've gone to church for any amount of time around Easter, you have undoubtedly heard a message about Jesus triumphantly entering into Jerusalem on a donkey and people laying down palm branches or cloaks for him to make his way into Jerusalem. Today, we are going to talk about the same thing. We're going to talk about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, but I want to actually focus on the disciples and their actions in the midst of all of this because I believe that there is much for us to learn from them. So we're going to jump right in. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. And it says this, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We're going to start right there. I have a quick map for you because I channeled my inner John this week just to kind of show you where we are at. And so if you can see here, this dot right here is there's Bethphage, there's Bethany, and there's the Mount of Olives. And then there, at the almost at a weird triangle, there's Jerusalem. Hey, the Mount of Olives is actually the top of this mountain. And this is, this is a route that I want to tell you that they have traveled much. Bethany, if you remember what happened in Bethany, uh, Bethany is actually the place uh, where Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead. So this is not unfamiliar territory to the disciples. This is not unfamiliar territory uh, for the people to see Jesus, to, to see Jesus do things, or to have the Lord ask for things or say things to them. This is a normal uh, journey for them, but they are right here where this dot is. It's the Mount of Olives. So they can see what is going on. 
are where they are headed. And so I, I want to just point that out for you, just as, as you can see where we are. So these two locations are just outside of Jerusalem. And the other thing is this is where people are gathering because people are getting ready to go into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So this is a path that a lot of people uh, would take. Now, this is super interesting. We can pop off this one. But this is interesting for me because Jesus knows that his time has come. If you actually just flip a chapter ahead to Matthew chapter 20, 18 and 19, Jesus actually looks at his disciples and predicts his death for the third time. He says, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and he will hand, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. So Jesus predicts his death. Jesus knows that his time has come. It has come to prove that he is who he says that he is and to fulfill the prophecies that have been stated about him for generations to come. That is where we are with Jesus. But I'm going to ask you to shift your gaze from Jesus for a second, and I want you to put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of the disciples at this moment. I want you to imagine the life that they live, being called out of being fishermen, being called out of their professions to simply follow Jesus and to make fishers of men, like to be fishers of men, to bring people to know that the kingdom of God has come near and that Jesus is the Savior that has been prophesied about. So they have sat there, they have walked this journey with Jesus for about three years, and they have seen the impossible become possible. Right? So you, you've seen these. Imagine yourself in these sandals. You have been on the boat where the wind and the waves were blowing. Hey, I don't know how you, you guys were aware the other day. Was it, what was it, third Friday? Was it Friday? Thursday, Friday? We had like 90 mile an hour winds coming through. Like, I don't know how many of y'all freaked out. I did not. I was actually making popcorn on the stove, though I should have been in the basement. But like, imagine being a disciple and you're on this boat and it's rocking with these 90 mile an hour winds and the water is like crashing and crashing and you're looking at Jesus like yo we came with you why are you sleeping and you just watch this man get up and just command vocally command them to be still and they stop you you follow Jesus into towns where you've seen him just expel a legion of of demons out of another person you have seen this for yourself you have seen lepers healed you have been you have seen those deemed the worst by society saved because Jesus simply chose to meet them where they were at and to love them not to mention that you saw these miracles because this same man called you out to follow him now as you approach Jerusalem Jesus tells you hey guess what my time is up I'm going to die this man is letting you know that you are walking into a situation where he will be betrayed and killed. Now you have to imagine that at this moment, the disciples are really counting the cost of following Jesus. Like imagine standing on this mountaintop and Jesus is like, yeah, we're going there. But let me tell you what's going to happen there. I'm going there to die. I'm going there to fulfill all the things that we've been talking about. And you're sitting there like that, and you're like, wow, you've got to be counting the cost of, like, if he's going to die, what's going to happen to us? If they're ready to kill him, if he knows that he's going to die and be betrayed, like, what is going to happen to us? They are really counting the cost of following Jesus. I mean, think about your life. Like, what questions would you be asking yourself at this moment? Is it worth it? Like, can I turn around and go back down the mountainside? Maybe take the left and take the long route to Jerusalem and not roll with him? Could you call him crazy and just dismiss everything that he's done up until this point? Call him a liar? I mean, we were, we've now arrived just miles outside of Jerusalem between Bethphage and Bethany, and you can see this destination. And as you get to this mountaintop and you're counting this cost, Jesus looks at you. You're one of the two that he looks at. And he says, I got some specific instructions for you. I'm sending you on a mission. And he says, hey, I want you to leave our party. And I want you to go ahead to the village ahead. I want you to find and untie the donkey and the colt. Bring me the donkey and the colt. And if anybody stops and asks you, what are you doing? Just tell them that the Lord needs them. You're counting the cost of your life, not knowing what's happened. And Jesus is like, hey, break away from us. I don't know about you. The first time I read this, I was like, this is your opportunity to run. Like, I'm going to grab the donkey or the closest horse, and I'm going to take off. I'm not going 
to that place, let alone stealing something from somebody else for this dude who just told me he's about to be betrayed and died. What did he do? Right? But Jesus is telling them to do this. Listen, we have all been in this space in our lives. That space of like something, you're counting the cost, you're questioning what's going on, you're doubting. Like maybe like for me, it's like whenever life throws me lemons, like a job loss or a family dynamic change or a housing transition or a friendship conflict or anything like that, it seems that like Jesus is telling the Holy Spirit to prompt me to take on a task that I'm like, yo, Jesus, I have no space for this. Like, I want to curl up in my bed and sleep and not move. I don't want to do this. Like, I am so stressed about trying to make this payment at the end of the month on the house. I am so stressed about trying to get my kid to school. I am so stressed about handling this relationship dynamic because I don't want to lose this person as a friend or the relationship I have as a family member. I can simply cannot go do that thing that you're asking me to. I simply cannot go and have that conversation. I cannot go do that task. I can't go on mission. I don't want to have coffee. I don't want to hang out. I want to focus on myself. I want to focus on the things that I need. I mean, oftentimes when I find myself in this situation, I find myself acting like David when he's running through the caves for his life and literally just asking God, how long are you going to keep asking me to do the same thing? How long are you going to keep ignoring what I need right now and ask me to do something else that's completely out of the energy that I have, completely out of that. Like, how long? And what I realized this week as I was just preparing this is that Jesus was literally knows that the disciples are questioning these things. If you keep reading down the story as we lead up to the resurrection, Jesus literally tells them, hey, you, Peter, you know how strong you are? You're going to deny me three times. Hey, somebody at this table that's eating with us right now is going to be the one to leave and betray me. Right? Jesus knows what they're thinking. He knows that they're counting the cost right now, but he's simply asking them to pause and reframe their thoughts, their thought process, and to start asking different questions. He's simply asking them to say, hey, what am I still holding back? Like, what are you still holding back from me? Jesus is saying, what are you holding back from me? So what are you holding back? Jesus is looking at you saying, hey, am I actually Lord over everything in your life? Have you actually given me every area of your life? He's saying, what in your life do you need to lay down and trust in me right now? He's just asking you to simply reframe the questions and reframe your thought process to think about, man, how much do I love you? How much do I trust you? How much do I have faith in what you're saying and what you've been saying and what you've been doing and what is about to happen? In real time in my life, when I find myself in these thought questions, these processes, I find it helpful to reflect on my own faith journey in these moments because I need to remind myself that Jesus has always been exactly who he has claimed to be and won't ever change. When you reflect on it, like when you reflect on it, you are reminded about the maturation of your faith and your trust in Jesus. And that brings me to my first point for today is this, the depth of your faith in Jesus correlates with your obedience, conviction, and energy to live out your faith. There is a really weird thing going on right now in the social media world where people are making funny videos about like mess around and find out. That's the church version of it, mess around and find out, right? And it's this little graph like you keep messing around and like the more you're going to find out. Right? And what I'm saying is, you keep taking those steps of faith, of obedience, and following your convictions, and following that energy towards living out your faith, like, your, the depth of your faith, the rootedness of your faith, the depth, the water, the things that you were soaking in from Jesus is just going to continue to grow. That graph is just going to go like this. I mean, I think about it like this. When I look at my own kid, in 2015, we were in our house, at, we were in a different house at a time, and I just got home from work, dinner was on the stove, it was smelling absolutely delicious and I was starving. It's the middle of winter and the Blackhawks are about to play the game. The TV is on, the pregame show is on, and if you know my child Kaya, she was three years old, Kaya's sitting on the steps and I'm like, hey girl, I'm like, how you doing? And she's like, dad, I really pray that Sharpie is going to play tonight. And she just prayed for Patrick Sharp to play the game tonight. That's what she did. That's all she wanted. She wanted her favorite player, Sharpie, to play. Dear God, I pray that Sharpie gets to play tonight. 
And sure enough, that night, Sharpie was in the lineup. Her excitement when he skated out, 10 slides on, and she's jumping in front of the TV because her favorite player is out there. And what I recognized in that moment is Kaya's faith and trust in Jesus grew. It was a silly little prayer that her favorite Blackhawk player would play that night, and he did. But she prayed, and she followed her conviction, and she put the energy, and she was obedient to whatever she felt that she needed to do, and it happened. That's like a silly little thing. But our examples sometimes in our lives are bigger. I mean, like what moments like this in your life? Like when you stop and you reflect on your spiritual journey, what steps of faith did you take and realize that there is a step or, or that this was a step or a foundational ground there? Like in these moments that you find your faith growing, like it, it's in these moments that you find your faith growing that you begin to trust Jesus and decipher the Holy Spirit's voice amongst all the voices in the world. I mean, this is why it's important to continue to read your Bible, to listen and to obey the Holy Spirit, to communicate with Jesus, and to strive to be like Jesus, because these are all faith step moments. These are all moments where you're stepping out and you don't know what's going to happen. Right? You don't know if there's going to be another step there. You don't know if that's a cliff and you're stepping off. You don't know if there's solid ground there or if it's quicksand. Like, these are all those things that happen. Like, these are the moments in your day and your life that remind you of his goodness, his faithfulness, his grace, and his love towards you all of your life. Listen, I want you to take a moment right now and reflect on your personal journey. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let you take like a brief moment just to reflect on your own spiritual journey. And I want you to think about those faith moments where you stepped out and had no idea where you were stepping. Look, when you think about your journey... Can you honestly say that you are willing to go and obediently follow what the Lord is calling you to do in this season, in your life, or maybe even in a specific situation that's going on right now? If you're thinking about it and you're saying, no, I'm not, ask yourself this, what is holding you back right now? What is holding you back? What do you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus right now? I want to remind you, like, this is nothing new. The disciples are having these same thoughts. They're reflecting on the same journey. They're going back to being called out of the boats. They're going back to watching Jesus call out the legion of demons. They're going back to the wind and the waves crashing on the boat. They're going back to the lepers being healed. They're going back to watching Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They're going back to all these moments where they've seen God's goodness and faithfulness and love and grace towards his people. They're doing the same thing I'm asking you to do right now. They're reflecting on their faith journey with Jesus. And in the midst of their thoughts and their processing, let's just see how their faith, how the faith of the disciples caused them to react to the instructions of Jesus. We're going to pick it back up in our story in verse 6. It says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Listen, I once again want to bring your focus to the disciples in their actions. We see that the disciples went and did exactly as instructed. They went and they retrieved the donkey and the colt for Jesus and brought them back together. The depth of their faith, the depth of their trust in Jesus caused them to be obedient. It caused them to act on their convictions to go do what he was saying and to bring that energy to it. You can't, I don't think they slumped to go get the donkey. I think they were moving and they were trying to get back knowing that time was short.
And why not? When you step back and you think about the imagery of Jesus coming in on a cult, it represents two words to me, humility and purity. Like Jesus is not coming in on a stallion, like a king returning victorious from battle. Like he's not coming in, but instead he's, he's choosing meekness. He's coming in on a colt. Like he's coming in on a donkey. Donkeys are supposed to be dumb. Right? Like that's what he's coming in on. The other thing is a colt is a baby. It's a, it's a young donkey. That means this thing has never been ridden. Jesus is coming in in meekness and purity. Like, he, this donkey has never been, like, ridden. Like, Jesus' humility was met with humility from the disciples. And they followed that example. I mean, listen to this. Jesus was so humble to come on a donkey, they all laid their cloaks. They all took their cloaks off. And they laid them on the donkey and the colt for Jesus to lay on. And my favorite thing about this is people are watching you just like people were watching the disciples. They watched the disciples do this. You know what they said? They're like, whoa, I can... I, I should totally do that. Can you imagine if I just laid something down and then everyone in this room started laying something down and then people outside in the parking lot started laying stuff down and we went all the way to Oak Brook Mall and people were laying stuff down. You went all the way up to Lake Geneva and people were laying stuff down. You go all the way up to Canada. People are just laying stuff down for Jesus to arrive because we just responded to the humility of our Savior that we follow. That's all that's happening right now. Every disciple lays down their cloak on the cult for Jesus to sit on as he rides into town. And again, begging us to ask the question as followers of Jesus, what areas in our lives do we need to surrender to Jesus? What are the cloaks in our lives that we need to lay down? Do you have the cloak of relationships? Are you holding on to relationships? Hey man, if I, if I totally take this step of faith and say this bold thing about Jesus that I believe in this conviction, like, am I going to lose this relationship? Hey, if I lose that, I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to step over here. Maybe that cloak you need to lay down is money. Maybe, like, you get up, you're like, man, I would totally support the church and the mission and the vision. Like, I would totally support those things if I had the extra money. Instead of saying, man, this is holding me back from all these faith steps that you have for me. Because guess what? I know it's going to be a struggle, but I believe, Lord, in what you're doing. And I believe that you are the one that is in control of all things. Just like you're in control of this owner and the donkey that he's going to give to you. Like, you are in control of all things. You have authority over all things. And I believe that if I give what little that I have, Lord, that you will bless it. And I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel. I'm talking about an obedience and a conviction and an energy and a faith to know that God is who he says that he is and he has what is best for you. I have been broke. I have had no money and I've still given to churches because I believe in the vision and the mission. Did I get money back in return? No, but I have a life where I can look back and say, man, I didn't have it at the end of that month, but I gave it and I'm still here and my kids are still taken care of and my bills are still paid and we're still eating food on the table right now. I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel. I'm talking about a conviction to be obedient to the Lord and putting all of my energy and my focus into doing that, whatever it takes. That's just money. Maybe you have the cloak of life decisions. Maybe you like, I I had this moment. I'll tell you all this right now. I had this moment. It was 2010. I was sitting there after our last program had ended, and I had two choices. I could pursue the dream of being a millionaire and playing football for the rest of my life, or I could be like, Lord, what do you have for me right now? And I said, Lord, what do you have for me right now? And I'm doing it. Everyone told me to run from this, and I'm doing it. Because this is what he had for me. But what life decisions are the cloaks that you need to lay down? What are you worried about? What are you worried about? I wrote this last one down and I had to chuckle because I've had this cloak in my life. And the last cloak I have for you is like, like, is the cloak in your life just communing with Jesus daily? Like, do you have that thing of like, yo, I want to hit the snooze button for the fourth time and sleep. But if I do that, I'm going to miss out on this like 15 minutes to have quiet time with the Lord. Or do you have that like, man, I got to get up and make lunches and I got to make my lunch and I got to work out and then I get to... The kids at school, I get to work, like, and I'm going to go home and go to sleep and do the same. Like, like do you have this cloak of, like, Lord, I, I just, like, I can't spend time with you because I'm so busy. I have other priorities. I can't make you my priority. Like, 
I had to laugh about this because I've had this cloak in my life where I make these excuses about why I can't commune with the Lord daily. It's a cloak that I needed to lay down. Listen, the disciples have clearly placed Jesus in the driver's seat of their lives. So who's in the driver's seat of your life? And that leads us to the second point today. It's just the depth of your faith in Jesus will determine who was in the driver's seat of your life. As I thought about a way to illustrate this point, I was going to sit here and I was going to sing y'all the song by Carrie Underwood, Jesus Take the Wheel. Only because it has such a value to me because this is a side tangent. Like John and I, when we first started in ministry together, we felt like we were drowning, trying to get things right. And we would look at each other and we got to the point where we would just look at each other and say, yo, Jesus, take the wheel. And that was right before events would happen. Right? We're like, yo, Lord, you're in the driver's seat. Whatever happens is going to happen. But I figured I wouldn't sing you guys Carrie Underwood. I would just tell you a sweet and daring story. So I'll actually never forget bringing Kaya home from the hospital for the very first time. Like we had to put her in the car and drive her home for the very first time. And I remember going down with all of Liz's bags and all the stuff, and I put that little, I put that little booster seat thing, the little, uh, what do you call it, the little seat thing the car seat goes in, I put it in, and I remember putting my foot on the seat, and I was like, oh, I got to pull as tight as I could. I was like, I think I just bent the anchor under the seat. I was pulling so tight because I was going to make sure my baby was safe, right? I pulled the strap so tight. And once we finally made it into the car, like, I'll never forget this. Liz sits in the back seat because she's nervous. And then I pull off really slow. And the first thing Liz says to me while I'm driving, I freak out. She's like, it's so bright. I was like, it's so bright. It's so bright. Wait. I'm like, what do you want me to do? Like, she's worried about how bright it is in Kaya's face. But let me tell you, we drove so slow. I promise you, this is the slowest I have ever driven in my life. If you've ever followed me anywhere, my nickname is Mario Andretti. I like to get places, and I like to get places fast. And I drove so slow because all I could think about was being in control and getting my brand new, fresh and fragile baby home. My baby is now 11. Thank the Lord, I have some time. But in a few short years, I always think about how I'm going to be handing her my keys to drive my car by herself. This scares me. And it doesn't scare me, it doesn't scare me because she's reckless. It doesn't scare me because she's naive. It doesn't scare me because she's easily distracted. Like that, that's not what scares me. What scares me is for the first time, I will not be in control of her destination. I will not be in control of how she gets there, how fast she gets there, which way she takes. Like, I will be handing her the keys. And by handing her these keys, it will force me to have to give up control. Because whoever's in the driver's seat is in control. And as I thought about this, I thought about how a lot of us, even just a lot of people, we find Jesus handy to have in the car with us, right? We want Jesus to be the like, backseat driver. Like, Lord, I need you in the car just in case I need you. Like, if something comes up and I require your services, I'm, I'm going to need to tap you in. Like, that's how we drive with Jesus in our lives, right? Like, like, hey, Lord, I have a health problem right now and I need some help. I want you in the car. But I'm not sure I want you driving this car on my health problem right now. Right? Because if Jesus is driving, then you're not in charge of your life anymore. If he's driving, you're not in charge of your wallet anymore. If you put him in control, there is no long, it's no longer a matter of giving some money now and then what am I, like, when I'm feeling generous or when it's more convenient for me in my life. Like, no, like Jesus is in charge of your wallet, and it's scary. Like If Jesus is driving, you are not in charge of your ego anymore. Like, I can no longer, I no longer have the right to satisfy my every self-centered ambition. Like, it's no longer my agenda, but his agenda. It's his life. Like, I'm not in charge of my, what I'm supposed to say out of my mouth anymore. Jesus is in the driver's seat. He's in control. And I love this. I'm pointing back to the disciples. The disciples understood this. When Jesus called them out of the boat, they gave him the keys. They gave him the keys. They said, you're in control. Where are we going? How are we getting there? Where are we going? 
right? Jesus, they gave Jesus the keys to their lives once he called them out of their old lives and into a new life of spreading the good news. So again, who is in the driver's seat of your life? Who is in control of your life? Who is the one making the decisions and leading the way? Those questions are really easy for me to ask you standing up here. It's really easy for me to ask you those questions, for you to answer those questions, because as I learned from John, it's fun to watch people squirm and be uncomfortable when you ask tough questions. But it's different when you're in the hot seat and you have to ask yourself that question. And I thought about that. I said, I mean, here are two very important questions that I think the disciples and ourselves, like we have to ask ourselves. And the first one is this, it's like, who do you believe Jesus to be? It is a very simple question with a very difficult answer. Like, who do you believe Jesus to be? And yes, you can sit there and you can, you can say the easy church answers. He's a savior. He's the son of God. He's from the line of David. Like, you can say those things, but who do you believe Jesus to be when life is on the line and you have to, it's life or death, who do you believe him to be? And the second question I love as I thought about this is, why are you following Jesus? And I pulled this one from this. When you think about what's happening right now, the disciples are following Jesus because they believe Jesus to be the Savior that was prophesied about. They believe Jesus to be the victorious and the humble and the gentle king that is going to save the people. They believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They believe this. That's why they're following Jesus. But I find it interesting that there's a crowd of people. How many people in that crowd are following Jesus because they believe those same things? How many people are in that crowd because they're like, yo, there's like 500 people going that way. Let's, let's, let's sneak into that crowd. It's like, how many people are following Jesus because the crowd is following Jesus? This is a real question in your life, in our culture right here and now. Why are you following Jesus? Are you following him because he's trendy? Like, are you following Jesus because, hey, my group of friends follow Jesus, so I'm going to follow Jesus too? Like, are you following Jesus because you believe he is who he's supposed to be? You believe that he is everything he said that he was going to be? So ask yourself those two, those two questions. Like, who do you believe Jesus to be? And why are you following Jesus? And I can tell you, even in this crowd, people are confused. Listen, they say when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, and they asked, who is this? And someone in the crowd said, this is Jesus, the prophet. Jesus the prophet. People in this crowd still don't understand who Jesus is. They're following this crowd because there's a crowd of people following Jesus. They called him a prophet. Like people in this crowd do not understand who this is. But there are people in the crowd who do know who Jesus is because they're the ones shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Those are the people who are following Jesus because they know who Jesus is to them. Those are the people who have tasted the goodness of Jesus and that is why they choose to follow him. So I'm going to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is who he is? Do you believe that? Hey, verse 10 says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? When I looked up the word stirred, it wasn't like, they were just kind of like, oh. Like, it was like the whole city was set on fire. Like, yo, what is going on? Like, who, like, it was like, who is this dude with the audacity to ride in here on a donkey? Like, he is somebody important. That's what this means. Like, there are people like, yo, who, like, you guys, I'm, I'm going to be really, really, you guys remember in 2020 when there was, like, riots going on and people were like, they're coming down my street. Like, those Black Lives Matter protests, they're coming down my street. This is what the people of Jerusalem are like. Jesus is coming down my street. Like, like, this dude is coming down my street. I don't know who it is. He's coming for me. That's not what's going on right now. I'm telling you, we live in a world and are surrounded by a culture that is asking the same question as the people of Jerusalem. They're saying, who is this? Only they're not sitting on a street looking at the actual man of Jesus coming down at them. They're looking at us. They're staring at you. They're staring at me. And that's what they're trying to base who Jesus is. Like, they are looking directly at you and me and the so-called Christians of the world. And they're asking the question, who is this Jesus? 
If you thought about yourself, if you thought about your friends, if you thought about the people you interact with, who would people say that Jesus is based on how you live your life? I mean, it's stated in John 13, 34, and 35. It says, a new, Jesus says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples, you are my followers, you believe in me, you trust in me, you share the gospel, you follow everything that I'm teaching and you spread what I am teaching if you love one another. Jesus called us to love one another as he loved us. Yo, when the world looks at you, do they see love, hate, or confusion? And I'm talking about all of you. Because there are people to your face that to your face you will see love. And then you pop on their social media and all you see is hate. I'm being real. Like, this is what we're talking about. When the world sees you, when the world looks at all of you, what do they see? Do they see love, hate, or confusion? I mean, are you loving the people of the world well? And I'm talking about even those that think differently and act differently than you. I'm talking about those who are taking a different route to get to Jesus than you. I'm talking about the people who look at the fork in the road and say they're going to make their own path off of each thing and find their own way to Jesus. Are you loving those people well? Listen, are you choosing to love them because they're created in the image of God? I have this thing that I used to say to my youth group kids all the time. I said we are called to love people because they are created in the image of God, period. There is no but this. There is no but that. We are all created in the image of God. And for that reason alone, we are called to love people. Because we're loving an image of the Lord. We're loving a piece of who God is in the people that he has created. So are you choosing to love them because they are simply created in the image of God and nothing else? Are you choosing to love them because Jesus has not only told us to, but showed us how to love them well? And those moments in your life where you're like, uh, I can't love that person because they're living that lifestyle. I can't love that person because they're trying to push that agenda. I can't love that person because that looks completely different than what I believe. Do you go back to your Bible and look what Jesus did? Jesus could have looked at Zacchaeus and be like, I can't love that man. The dude's cheating my people. No, he called him down and went to his house and saved him. The leper, people walk, people outcasted lepers and Jesus said, come on, let's go. Let's heal him up. The lady who's internally bleeding just touches his cloak and she's healed because she believed. Loving people that are different than you, that think different, that act differently than you because Jesus showed us how to do it well. Like he's not asking you to do something that he's never done before. I don't know about you, but that is so convicting for me. Do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not. And that's why I said we have to strive to live like Jesus. Listen, we celebrate Palm Sunday to remind ourselves that Jesus is coming back to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. Like we celebrate Palm Sunday as a reminder to continue preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus. And one of the most important actions that we can do to celebrate and remember Palm Sunday, not just today, but all year, our whole life, is to love people the way that Jesus loves us. Think about how the Lord loves you through all of your stuff. So I'm going to call the band up here as I wrap up. But as you go into Holy Week this week, take the time to reflect and be transparent with Jesus. Like if Jesus is not in the driver's seat of your life, or if you find yourself lacking the conviction or the energy or the obedience in your spiritual walk, take time to pray and ask what are the areas of my life that I need to lay down at the feet of Jesus right now? Here's my ask for you, not only today, but for the rest of your life. Simple thing. What do you need to do in order to joyfully surrender to Jesus being the driver of your life? What do you need to do to embrace the journey that he has placed you on and follow him not only to the cross, but into eternal life? Bow your heads with me. Lord, I'm so, 
I'm fired up, God, because you didn't have to do what you did this week. You didn't have to ride into Jerusalem knowing that you were going to die for me, knowing that I was just going to spit in your face, knowing that I was just going to tarnish your legacy, knowing that I was just going to do everything in my will possible to run away from you. But Lord, you showed us a better way. Lord, you, you, you loved us through all of our stuff. You loved us through our, our, our thick and our thin and our, our highs and our lows and everywhere in between. God, I pray that as we go through this week, as we go forward in our lives from this point, God, that we would continue to grow deep and root our faith in you, God, so that we may be obedient and that we may act on the convictions that you give us with energy and passion and zeal because we are doing them for you. God, I pray that our faith is so deep that we have no problem giving you the keys, pulling the seat back and relaxing and knowing that you are in control and getting us from here to eternal life. God, we live in a world that when they look at us, those who call ourselves followers of you, God, they're seeing more hate and confusion than love. God, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to love those, to love everyone the way that you loved us. Because of all the sinners, God, I am the worst. And you still saved me. You still saved us. God, we are so grateful that you call us your children. We are so grateful that you have called us into eternal life with you, that you have sent your son to die for us so that we may be reconnected with you eternally. Lord, we praise you for what you've done. And we continue to follow you and be obedient to you because we know of what you're about to do. your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet.